listening, I will share the screen. And Hassan, can you wave if you can see my uh, um, uh, thing? Okay, it's, the the shared screen is working all right. I can't see it. You can't. No, I can't see it. No, no, no. I see a black screen, and I see this G from uh, from you, but. Uh... Ah, because you should be seeing Popper and Critical Rationalism Lecture 10. I see a black screen. I After see Lecture 10. Ah, let me just see. Does that work? Okay, so. okay everything works now. Everything works, works for me. Now. Okay, that's fine. Let me make a start. Um, what I'm going to be uh, talking about episode of stuff on the limits to reason and I'm going particularly to be talking about some issues concerning Popper and critical rationalism. Could I also mention that I have a something coming up on my screen saying that the internet me know if there is a problem in uh, listening to me, okay. I, I hit this as an issue. Jeremy, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, I will try to reconnect because I have uh, have trouble. Okay. Yes. Okay. I will uh, disconnect and try to reconnect. Okay. Right. So we'll limit. I've early. Uh, documented Popper's initial views about the limits of reason and the way in which in his views about what um, and about the way in which his views about what is discussable shifted so as to include metaphysics. Today's topic is rather different and involves several interconnected problems. One starting point is with was as a young man, an enthusiastic Marxist, but he then became disillusioned with Marxism. And at the same time, he read Søren Kierkegaard. Now, in Alistair McIntyre's A Short History of Ethics, uh, if you're in... This is an issue raised by Kierkegaard in the following terms. Suppose one believes one's moral position can be rationally justified. This means that one can justify it from certain premises. But these premises then have to be justified. And okay. we must reach the point where we simply choose to stand by certain premises. He placed argument. This analysis, however, can then be applied to rationalism itself. That's to say, rationalism might be understood in various ways. For example, on argument. But what about rationalism itself? Can rationalism be justified? 
or must it after the fashion of Kierkegaard's analysis itself rest on some must at this point decision replace argument this kind of first he reports on at some point remonstrating with a nazi and getting a response back along roughly the following lines argument is a jewish disease when people start talking about argument I reach for my pistol. There are, however, three issues here. First, is there anything that can compare instead? On the face of it, it's not obvious that there's an argument that will do this. Second, is his position a commitment to his views on a par with Popper's? The answer here seems to me to be no. Why? Well, first of all, human knowledge is fallible. I mean, the only person who doesn't seem to think that he's ever wrong uh, is Donald Trump. Uh, in the face of our fallibility, argument from other people. And this requires This is an option from which the Nazi is closing him. Sense in which the Nazi is doing something that's rather strange because he's likely himself to make use of reason and argument in a routine way. Copy of the logic of scientific discovery. He would have to make instrumental use of reason to draw the content out of his ideas as to what he'd have to do in order to accomplish that. While well, he might well have this aim. But the other guy might say, this can is in fact not petrol. revise what he was wanting. Clearly, there may be situations in which one puts rational argument to one side. If there's an emergency and stopping to open one's proposed actions to criticism is likely to make things worse. Or if criticism seems unfruitful. For example, if one simply received a, a string of If one might be doing the wrong thing, but the suspension in such circumstances of openness to criticism sometimes seems reasonable enough. There is, however, a deeper issue in Popper's work here. It is that in his open society, he seems I wish us to draw from Kierkegaard to suggest that the rationalist must make a non-rational commitment to reason. Compare, for example, quote, whoever adopts the rationalist attitude does so because he's adopted some proposal or decision May be called irrational or and reason. I've got a comment being made that there is a problem with the sound. I You might recall that in an earlier lecture, I mentioned that when Popper, as a young man, became disillusioned with Marx, 
Africa to exhibit some skepticism about reason itself. He wrote briefly about this in a draft of, an, of his autobiography that's held in the Hoover archive with a copy also at Klagenfurt. This material is discussed briefly by Harkoen in his very good book about the early popper, and also by Bartley in the one chapter that we have from this By contrast with Popper, Bartley had a live interest in religious issues. Sorry, someone suggested I reboot the computer. Sorry. Jeremy, it's literally every second sentence is questions. Gone about this aspect of rationalism. He wrote his PhD, quite what the relationship between this and his book, The Retreat to Commitment was, I'm not quite sure. There is a certain There isn't anything that I can do about that, but do look at the overheads. So there is an issue about the relationship, but retreat to commitment. He also published several papers about these issues. One interesting source is his paper Rationality versus the Theory of Rationality in Maria Bunga's Popperfest Schrift, The Critical Approach. I'll provide references to this Just say to people, there is a problem with the internet connection. I can't do anything about it. And it doesn't really help to keep sending me messages about it, that this is a problem I don't know how to overcome. Here is a picture of Bill Bartley. A useful way in, to get into these issues is by way of his analysis of different types of rationalism. He noted that some rationalists had made statements along the lines that a rationalist is someone who will only hold views if they're rationally justified. This is what Bartley to readers of Popper on Friese's trilemma, as well as to readers of Kierkegaard, because you just generate a regress of justification. A second view assumes one could then consistently be a rationalist. This, because he considered that it was also to be found in Popper, he called critical rationalism, but he said, well, but Bartley raised the following problem about it. There were various religious so-called fideists who took the view that one had initially to make a religious commitment within which one could then those rationalists who thought one needed to make a commitment to reason were on problematic ground. Fideist's ideas, these people could respond, you too, or in Latin, tu quoque. 
That's to say, they could claim that their views were symmetrical with those of the rationalists. Each of them was simply making a commitment. So that the rationalists had no basis on which to criticize them. Their positions were symmetrical. I indeed think that there is a problem here, but I'm not sure that there is a complete parallel. But the rationalist could surely say, look, I'd agree that we each make a commitment, but mine is simply to the use of reason, while yours is to a substantive position, perhaps a theological position, and then to the use of reason in its explication, in its discussion, and to the critical appraisal of ideas within your but yours is surely of a different character from mine, and it's much more problematic than is mine. That being said, Bartley had, I think, highlighted a real problem. That's to say that there was something problematic about a rationalist depending on a non-rational assumption of having first partly brought out a theme that we've noted in Popper, namely his rejection of justificationist argument. That's to say Popper, in fact, has a response to Kierkegaard. Popper has a response to Kierkegaard. It is that the problem in Kierkegaard is posed by the equation of rationality with justification. Proposes that rationality be equated with openness to criticism, Kierkegaard's problem to argue that one does not, in consequence, need to make the fideist looking move the one can advance what he called comprehensively critical rationalism or CCR. The idea here is that one proposes that rationality be equated that CCR can be applied to itself. That's to say it's claimed that it is open to criticism and that it is where of course is to bear in mind that open to criticism, openness to criticism isn't the same thing as it's actually being faulty. Someone may advance a criticism, you may discuss it with them, and you may come to the conclusion that actually the criticism isn't right. And to reject it or to modify our views. Bartley's ideas, however, were themselves criticized. John Watkins. He argued especially that it looked as if Bartley's challenge show that comprehensively critical rationalism can't be criticized. That someone was able to advance a criticism to that effect. What would they have done? It would appear that they would have criticized CCR is open to problematic about the very challenge that the notion of opening it to criticism is one where you win if it problematic. A key source here is Bartley and Radnitsky's collection, Evolutionary Epistemology, Rationality, 
and the Sociology of Knowledge that contains a number of papers on this stuff. Another interesting source is the second expanded edition of Bartley's book, Retreat to Commitment. It's always seemed to me personally, since I was an undergraduate student, that there was actually an easy enough response to this issue which Watkins had raised. Um, I could mention that when I was an undergraduate, one of the other undergraduate students was a guy called Carl Theodore. Uh, he was from um, uh, the West Indies, and uh, I discussed this issue with him. And at a small seminar, teaching seminar that Watkins was running, uh, I, I said, well, look, Carl and I have been discussing Watkins in what might be said, but then uh, when I explained that I meant Carl Theodore, uh, and uh, when I further explained what I was trying to suggest, he became a lot less interested. The response was that a simple enough response from Bartley's side would be to argue it's open to criticism. Uh, if that could be done, shouldn't it self-count the claim that CCR was an adequate theory of rationality. What's the point of this? Well, it's ad hoc. It simply says we will introduce a sort of twist in all of this in order it's ad hoc. But in another way, it would seem to me an innocuous move to make, as it simply served to bar this wasn't something that one wanted CCR. It was a problem if this kind of self-reinforcing character appeared to be a feature of CCR. And it seems to me that in this particular kind of case, one can perfectly validly make this sort of CR itself uh, uh, allowing uh, the fact that someone could show that it wasn't criticizable uh, to actually be a point in its favor. It seems to me that Bartley's approach was a very useful one. On the one side, I think that it removed something that in Popper's writings was really rather odd, namely this fideist, uh, uh, non-rational faith in reason stuff. On the other, I think Bartley's intervention served to bring out the anti-justificationist character of a Popperian approach to epistemology. And Bartley himself stresses that he doesn't really think that Popper is actually disagreeing with what he has to say about this stuff, and that he's really making clearer uh, something that he thinks was running through Popper's epistemology all along. I also think that it addresses a significant issue, namely, is rationalism in the same boat as religious fideism, and that he suggests that the answer is no. Although it would be interesting if there could be a response to this by fideists. That's the sort fideism, which applied its own distinctive standards to itself. Might they say, well, this position ends up being completely parallel to uh, uh, CCR. It seems to me also that to add to the initial response that I earlier offered to the pistol problem, as to say, not only was there the sense in which the rationalist view is a cogent one in the face of the phenomenon of human fallibility, but CCR has to hand a cogent response. If it's asked, but isn't your commitment to reason a non-rational one? 
namely the proponent of CCR can respond that it is not a commitment, but is instead a tentative theory, which is in principle open to criticism. What of criticism of On the one hand, there are criticisms like that of Watkins, in which it's argued that there are formal problems generated by its reflexive or self-referring character. There is a guy called Post who has written at some length. I think that the right tactic to adopt in the face of these is to adopt a strategy of avoiding them by uh, making small modifications to the formulation of CCR so that they don't arise. Why is this legitimate? Essentially because one isn't, as far as I can see, trying to solve problems, for example, like those in set theory, in which what serves to generate the problems plays an essential role. One's not here dealing with something which is comparable to the problems in logic uh, by analogies with which Post and other people have argued. The problem with which we're concerned is one of rationality, not about logic in any deep sense. One can genuinely strengthen the theory by simply barring anything that generates this kind of problem just because to the degree to which it occurs, it actually serves to limit the extent to which to say, uh, just before I get on to the next point, I should also say that uh, David Miller uh, doesn't agree with this and he has in his book, Critical Rationalism, a, a discussion of some of these matters, which if you think they are problems that should be taken seriously, it's worth having a look. He has, for example, in his collection, Essays on Realism and Rationalism, argued that CCR is defective because it suggests that something is rational simply if it is open to criticism. But Musgrave argued to state the moon is made of green cheese is open to criticism, but we'd hardly say that holding it is rational. Musgrave's point seems to me fine as far as it goes, but on the face of it, all it self-written, I quote, a position may be held rationally without needing justification at all, provided that it can be and is open to criticism and survives severe examination. And it's the second bit of this which would rule out Musgrave's case. That's to say that our theory of rationality should, as does the general Popperian approach, say that first our ideas should be open to criticism, that they shouldn't yet be refuted, and also I'd suggest meet with the suggestions that Popper made in truth, rationality, and so on, which I've discussed in earlier lectures, or if it's not an empirical theory, be open to a discussion of Popper's ideas concerning metaphysics. I should also add that William Berkson, who did his PhD with Popper, has written a paper criticizing anti-justificationism. He's going to be delivering this at the second Zoom Popper conference in September. He and I have had some discussion of it, but I can't actually see how it constitutes a criticism of Bartley's approach. you'll need to sign up and get an invitation. CCR. There seem to me three different respects in which CCR is potentially fruitful in the sense of being interesting. There may well be 
anti-justificationist character of justificationist elements in it should be removed. This, I would have thought, is an interesting and challenging pro programmatic task for anyone interested in critical rationalism. And I'll stress, and I'm going to stress particularly at the end of the lectures, that it seems to me that critical rationalism is best seen itself as being a research program in which there are outstanding problems and lots of challenges and interesting things on which people who find the approach attractive. This then leads to the question, does such an approach really work as a response to, say, McIntyre's feeding of Kierkegaard? Let's just say, does a replacement of justificationism by openness to criticism in fact resolve this, in my judgment, key problem of rationality? More generally, one would need to identify and then face up to all non-formalistic criticisms that have been made so far of CCR and to show whether or not these can be met. If these things interest you, see David Miller's discussion of CCR in his Critical Rationalism, uh, which discusses some of the problems in a bit more detail and suggests some things that are open issues and some things Oh. Neither Popper nor Watkin showed much interest. Does Bartley really manage to resolve the kinds of problem with which he was concerned? Does he really manage to resolve the kinds of criticism or better responses to criticism which come out of religious Can, as it were, critical rationalist, a critical rationalist approach stand not only as a competitor to the religious viewpoints he was discussing, but also as something which has the advantage over them of not requiring a non-rational commitment? Or is it a mistake to see CCR as being a view that a religious person cannot hold? And there's an interesting uh, issue about Bartley's own career. He was originally planning uh, to be a clergyman, and he actually trained for that uh, um, when he'd finished his uh, Harvard degree, but uh, then gave up on that and stand particularly of some aspects of Christianity. But is there any necessary tension between CCR or between Popper's philosophy and religion. In general, it seems to me that work on critical rationalism and theology has been badly neglected. Third, there was another line of argument which Bartley investigated himself, for example, in some of the material added to the second edition of Retreat to Commitment. This related it to the question of whether there were elements of logic or of argumentative strategy more generally, which had to be made use of in criticism, which themselves cannot be questioned, just on the grounds that any reasoning about these matters would itself have to make use not just of logic, but of these specific rules of inference. This opens up some very interesting questions. I'm certainly not the right person to try to tackle them or to assess the significance of any answer which might be offered. But they certainly seem interesting and worth pursuing. And again, David Miller, in his discussion in his book, Critical Rationalism, about these things um, has And now a kind of coda to the lecture. Artigas 
line of discussion to which I should refer. Artigas has, in a rather strange book, entitled The Ethical Character of Popper's Theory of Knowledge, uh, in this, uh, he has a range of different concerns, although I think his title, The Ethical Character of Popper's Theory of Knowledge, puts things uh, very much round the wrong way. Articus, in effect, wants to say that what provoked uh, Popper into concerns about the theory of knowledge were ethical concerns when he found that um, led unarmed workers. And this got him interested in um, issues to do with the theory of knowledge and how one appraises theories and what constitutes something as being scientific. Uh, I think that there is a strong a sense in which Artigas seems to think that Popper's theory um, some work by a guy called Pisavetta, uh, which explores this as well. But in my view, ethical claims themselves need to be submitted to critical scrutiny. And for that, one actually needs than uh, stressing what in Popper's personal career had particular kind of effects, the direction that Articus is going is really a rather strange one. Uh, and epistemology, if it's going to play such a role, shouldn't itself make ethical presuppositions. I repeat, if an epistemology is going to evaluate ethical claims, it shouldn't itself be making ethical presuppositions, although it does seem to me that one can perfectly reasonably say that an epistemology might have some ethical consequences. And there is a way in which, in John Stuart Mill's If we have a concern for truth, this gives us a special reason for taking seriously other people as people who may be able to give us pertinent information or criticisms. And as I've argued elsewhere, uh, it might lead us to say that in order a certain kind of autonomy. by the elderly popper about Bartley's work on at some length. Uh, they were given at a seminar in part a repudiation by popper of the claim that a passage which Bartley criticized in his open society can correctly be taken as a statement of the be I've already quoted earlier in the lecture a few words about this, and it seems to me that Bartley's claim is a perfectly reasonable one. In part, Popper reports on his having made modifications to some aspects of his book at Bartley's suggestion using indeed Bartley's own formulations, such that Popper suggests that it's strange that Bartley continued to take issue with them. One problem about all this, though, is that, as Articus argues, it's more plausible to think of Bartley as having made substantive suggestions about Popper's appendix to the Open Society on facts, values, and truth, rather than about Open Society Chapter 24, which contains these other remarks. Popper was exceedingly elderly at the time that he made the comments in question in Japan. He was about 90. And my concern would be on the one side, 
that I think what one has to argue about here are problems and what Popper actually wrote rather than claims about his or Butler's intentions that Popper made a long while after the material was being written. While on the other hand, I don't know how good Popper's memory was at the end of his life. While I was working for him, his memory was already a little bit patchy. In many ways, it was utterly remarkable. And I will be very happy if I ever know as much as the elderly Popper did about things. But he had a slightly disconcerting habit of reconstructing what must have happened in order that what he'd done made sense and of reporting this as being his memory. I've no reason to rather than actually does always involve a lot of reconstruction. It is though interesting that when Trailsegger's Hansen was working on uh, his edition of Popper's Die Beiden Grundprobleme, the two fundamental problems of knowledge, in the 1970s, he faced the problem that Popper, when reading over what he was doing, wasn't really able to get and kept wishing to add footnotes, footnotes which made perfectly good sense. much sense if they were interpolated. What I'm saying is that in this case, Popper's comments and Artigas's commentary upon them. I'd also add that when I was working as Popper's assistant, one problem that I sometimes faced was that if I If I raised a problem about something that Popper had written and said, look, I, I think there's a difficulty here, rather than explaining why in his judgment I was wrong, Popper would be inclined to make modifications because I was pressing for them. In a world free affair. me in many ways to be at odds with what I took a critical rationalist approach really to be. Just because it in subjective and personal factors in a setting where what was needed was a discussion about the objective merits of the case. All that I conjecture here is that Bartley uh, could possibly, when he was working with Popper, have run into the same issue. It might, as Artigas mentions in passing, have to do with Popper's deafness. And if this is the case, he may well not have pressed points with regard to Popper's text in the way in which perhaps he might have wished to, just less Popper seemed to give way on personal grounds rather than recognizing and accepting the merits of the case that he was making. I can't First, Bartley presented his approach as a development of Popper's, but also as being in tune with what Popper himself offered. But Popper comes over as fideistic once one is aware of this as an issue. And that Popper seemed to be attached to his presentation and to presenting what he was talking about as an attitude rather than treating it as a... I personally think that Popper, sorry, that Bartley is right, that it is the repudiation of justification, which is perhaps the key theme in Popper. And I think an important role in, is played by Bartley's work in bringing this out clearly. My own view of CCR is fairly straightforward. 
I think there's a genuine problem concerning Popper's view. Four of the open society. I think that Bartley identifies it and offers an important resolution of the problem. I don't know of any telling criticism of CCR. Displaced and can and should be sidestepped. If formulations of CCR lead to these things, it should just be reformulated to avoid them. Next, I think that Bartley in stressing the non-justification character of Popper's approach more generally was performing a really important service. Not only does it help resolve ambiguities about the interpretation of Popper's work, but in my view, it should lead to a transformation in how we see philosophy. I am struck, for example, by the degree to which people still try to set out to prove substantive philosophical positions in the sense of trying to justify them. Of philosophical argument, the derivation of what one wishes to justify from things that are accorded axiomatic status, where they think or that somehow they can demonstrate these axioms themselves to be true. If it's interpreted as Bartley has suggested, can, I think, free us. But it is just this frame of which I would be keen to receive substantive critical discussion. Apologize once again for the problems with the uh, uh, internet. Uh, I will contact my uh, ISP and say that I've had this problem twice. It's clearly something that I need to find some way of getting over. Does anyone want to raise up? Ah, Luke. The second, huh? Um, yes. Hello, you can see me? <laughs> um, can't see you, but I can hear you. Oh, wait. Ah, this is my video. Uh, yeah. The first problem, I, I basically, um, with this problem, I agree with Makoto Kohowara. And he wrote, and this was also when Popper was there at the uh, conference uh, when he got to uh, receive the Kyoto Prize, and Makoto Kahowara said, actually, this kind of belief, it is, if it is combined with fallibilism, what is the problem with it? So I think this is the, the, the main point. It's, it's, Popper was a fallibilist, so if he says, I believe this or I believe that, but he is a fallibilist, so there is no, there, there, this cannot be com compared with uh, the, with Kierkegaard, with his uh, jump uh, of faith, it's something completely different. Eh? Well, I don't think so. This is the first thing I would I would remark. Yes. Jim. Popper oh, we presented this and seemed to be attached to presenting it. Law commitment to reason. And it's just as I think that Bartley can uh, can argue perfectly well that if you take the key to Popper's approach as being a non-justificationist one, then uh, you you can simply uh, put. Okay or not? Yeah, I didn't hear you. Uh, the yeah, problem we is don't hear you, yeah. That's the problem. Um, the second, the second thing I would like to say, like Mariano Artigas, I like his book, but it's the second part I like most, actually, not the the first part with this discussion. It's okay, I think, and actually, you can't say it's important because you're talking about it here, so it has some, it must have something. 
but uh, especially the second part I liked because he gave, he gave me this view, this insight. I also would like to mention that on many cases, on many uh, occasions, Popper wrote, and he wrote this explicitly, I think in one of his books, I, I would have to find the quote because it's not, this is on my computer, it's a tablet. And uh, he wrote that science is based on ethics. Yeah? Science is based on respect for truth, he said. So yeah, he wrote this several times that he believes in, and my, it's something like a humanist belief in human beings that, mm -hmm. but yes, he wrote it several times. Yeah? Yes. Okay. But there are two issues about that. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're concerned about truth, mm -hmm. concerned about criticisms that people make and so on, and in a certain sense to treat them in an ethical manner. But if you start with ethics, the problem is, well, there are different ethical views. And, and so, you, if someone says everything is based on ethics, you have to ask them, well, what ethics and on what grounds are these being preferred to other approaches in ethics? And for this, you need essentially to get into discussions of the epistemology of ethics. And this is something that I know Popper didn't like, but it seems to me that it's something which fairly obviously critical rationalists should be concerned with. So I personally think that talking about ethical foundations of Popper's epistemology is a, a bad move to make. Yeah, but that, this is the problem. Uh, and you can say that your epistemology is based on ethics, and now you want to say that your ethics is based on epistemology, but we are not just educationists, so... <laughs> no, epistemology, com uh, epistemology comes first. Mm -hmm. So this is a problem, but this is what Popper wrote. Eh? That's, uh, and I think Mariana Ortigas, I like his book, but the second part, of course, I like the one that is free on the internet. I think that's the best part. The first part, okay. He gives some interesting remarks that we can think about, but yeah, okay. That was uh, about his Kyoto speech. And the nicest thing is that he quotes uh, Makoto Kohawara. And I agree with him actually that if you combine something with fideism, with uh, fallibilism, that's not so bad. Uh, yeah. What what I will do is explicate mm. and and critically discuss the mm. position of both him and Kiesewetter in a later lecture. Um, oh, very nice. Okay. Mm. Now I, I just wanted to ask. Uh, John was got his hand yes. up. Was it just on this point? Uh, Margareta has had. <laughs> John? Yes, yes. Uh, I happen to be uh, actually writing right now uh, for my thesis on uh, a chapter on, on Popper's ethics. Huh? And uh, I, I find that, you know, he also said this about Marx, that uh, a lot of it, of, of what is uh, held as decency and basic ethics was, is sort of uh, thought of as being, um, you know, basically um, taken for granted, you know? Uh, I mean, he sort of describes what Plato's uh, Plato's ideas are about human beings and about um, you know uh, 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 creating a a, um, a society of, of natural masters over natural slaves, uh, and um, it, it's sort of like it's sort of like when uh, uh, Orwell writes. You know, he doesn't actually bother explaining why fascism is bad. Uh, mm. It's sort of uh, you know he talks about fascism. He talks about totalitarianism, and he talks about uh, uh, you know, humanism, uh, and it's sort of uh, second nature for him to say, okay, well, yeah, it's obvious our, he talks about our moral demands for equality, for freedom, and uh, for helping the weak. Uh, these are second nature for him, yeah? And of course, he acknowledges that these begin with Socrates and Jesus Christ, um, very much so, uh, uh, but that uh, Plato, in many ways, perverted what, what Socrates started out with. Um, and, um, of course, Platonism is very, uh, was very influential in the medieval church as well. Yeah? Can I respond? Look, sure. I've talked a bit about this before. There are two elements to it, or rather three. One of them is that when Popper wrote The Logic of Scientific Discovery, and he made
society, he had a restricted view of what was open to rational argument. And this gives a somewhat decisionistic character to his work. He was also really very put off uh, uh, ethical principles and so on. Sure. But, but uh, my own view is that one can actually apply his own epistemological ideas uh, to ethics and where mm -hmm. uh, in this context intersubjectivity would be really significant. I've published one thing about this and I've got another piece which both develops this and uh, with in relation to Popper's text and then also explains why I think Popper's own approach doesn't really work and if you send me an email, then I can, I'll, I'll very happily send those two things to you. But, so I would, but I would fully agree that Popper himself, I mean, uh, ethics plays a, uh, a big role, but where it doesn't actually play much role in his actual argument, the argument tends to be carried somewhat uneasily by methodological objections to people, but an element of that, I think, is really because this is something that at the time he thought there could actually be a uh, rational discourse about. But uh, in chapter five of the Open Society, he spends a lot of uh, effort developing the idea of critical dualism. You know? So mm. it is decisionistic. Uh, and that's kind of his starting point, because he argues that uh, uh, biological naturalism and spiritual naturalism, etc., can be used to argue completely opposite uh, ethical points. Um, and I, 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 yes, I think of course. The point, is, the point is that these things, these, these, you can't use facts to justify rational Yes, of argument. course. Yeah, yeah. Of course. I mean, that's. And I, I, I think you're actually on the right, right, right uh, track with that, with intersubjectivity, because he puts a lot of emphasis on the idea of the rational unity of mankind and everyone has something of value to say regardless of their uh, intelligence or education, etc. Um, it's a kind of egalitarianism, basically. Yeah, well, sorry, could, could I just explain? Sure. In, in the appendix uh, to volume two of the Open Society, Popper there and in certain other uh, later things comes pretty close to espousing moral realism. The problem about the material in the open society that you were talking about is that the discussion there is about the way in which um, uh, uh, ordinary facts rather than moral facts would constrain our uh, uh, Use, you have actually to interpret him as a sort of moral realist. And it, it's this position for, for, uh, which, which I, I've set out and argued and mm -hmm. have said basically that if you do that, then you can, make, uh, you can make use of his epistemology in that area. But send me an email and I will send you the, uh, the papers, okay? Thank you very much. Huh? Okay. Uh, it, uh, I've got Margarita next and then Carlos. Yes. Uh, Jeremy, I was wondering in this uh, discussion, I didn't hear you say anything about Aristotle's principle of non-contradiction and, and how that uh, plays a role in Popper's work. For instance, uh, that a reasonable person wouldn't change the meaning in the middle of a sentence to the opposite meaning. So that for him, I read Popper as saying the, the open society is, is like a two-way street. So we, we talk with other people and we uh, are making an ethical commitment to the principle, uh, to the law of non-contradiction and the law of the excluded middle. 
and that means that we're not going to change the meaning in the middle of a discussion and then uh, enjoy all the confusion that arises uh, because we have the the power to change the meaning and and that that he's actually talking about a commitment to uh to stick to um the rules so to say yeah but i don't see that it's an ethical commitment it, it on the one side it's needed if what one is going to be saying is intelligible that's to say that if we're talking about something and then just in the middle of it i uh change uh it's not what, I, what I'm trying to convey won't be clear. And I think myself that uh, it, it, it's something which you need uh, if you're interested in truth. It's something you need if you're interested in conveying something to people. But I just don't see, I mean, I can't myself quite see why you think it's helpful to talk about it as being ethical. Well, because we live uh, because that the principle if you look how it is being used in logic that logicians are not always very clear how they're using it and so they're kind of developing logics and and there may be not uh, the ones that Hassan is concerned with but they definitely exist where they actually allow for contradictions and also the one of the excluded middle and, uh -huh. and I call it ethical in that um, you make a commitment to the open society by saying, I will tell you when I'm going to change my meanings. And, and that there are people who actually Frozen are- briefly, can you come back to that? Okay, but, yeah. but you see- wait, wait, Can I just add something, just to, to, to maybe explain that what I think she's getting at. Uh, he does, <laughs> does put a kind of, a kind of uh, moral imperative on expressing himself clearly and 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 uh really attacking philosophers who don't do that like they do for example but look yeah. i but don't Jeremy, under, look yeah. you obvious one obviously wants if one's going to learn from someone else to be able to uh, uh do that but i i don't see that it is in any well Jeremy, uh, uh, I can... There may be technical things. I, I mean, for example, um, there are various different logics that people have developed to do different things, and it's, it's, it's a technical matter of what one chooses to do what kind of job. Well, if I may respond, I've personally experienced in the management community how people don't bother looking up how a term is originally used and then they attach a brand new meaning to it and they don't even bother to tell except somewhere in the middle of the article so, so that people don't realize there are all these different meanings floating around and then they say it's not really necessary to explain the meaning because that's like obsessional obsessive compulsive and so everyone is talking but no one is talking about the same thing so I don't think it is a technical commitment because it requires time and effort to do an effort to listen to what people mean and whether you, you're saying the same thing or something slightly different. But you can and just so, move in and clarify. Uh, yeah, I, but, I mean, but Jeremy, it's time consuming to clarify and not everyone, there is sometimes not enough time. That's the whole point of, yeah, but, sorry, writing. Yeah. But, but that is it, my case. It, it, seems, it seems that in Papa's view, uh, um, Hegel, for example, is being deliberately duplicitous. He's being his, his logic is developed so as to embrace contradiction, so as to be obscurantist intentionally. Well, uh, and that's Popper, ethical, no? Popper has, has certain. I mean, Hegel is obscure. I, I think also that. Theodore Adorno kind of tended to put things in, <laughs> in, in ways which he thought only the conoscenti would be able to appreciate and so on. And one might say is going on, it's really very bad. 
I would be much more inclined to say, well, there's some things in Hegel, in Hegel that are reasonably easily comprehensible and ascend. So, um, let me you, you, can, you can Excuse ask you. them to explain uh, um, these things more clearly. Jeremy, I apologize for interrupting because it was you, you didn't come through always clear. Uh, what, what I'm um, trying to okay, I'll, I'll rest my case for now. Yeah. Okay, I've got Carlos who's been waiting to come in. Yes. Yeah. Well, let me say something about this discussion. I would like to make a distinction between the. Uh, ethical values and non-ethical values, or if you want, for example, epistemic values, okay? So if I decide to write a, a paper on uh, the place of values in proper epistemology, I will say that to the extent that Popper uh, is claiming that he is after truth, okay? Then you will say, well, truth is an epistemic value. So Popper is committed in his epistemology, uh, for example, uh, to try to uh, uh, have a, a, a true uh, conception uh, of uh, epistemology, etc. Okay. So for me, it is clear that Popper have a commitment in his epistemology with some epistemic value that they serve for truth. It's a different thing for me than if you say, but Popper is committed to other values, for example, in the open society, yes, to ethical values. So I cannot, so the only thing I want to say here is that probably Artigas, he is wrong when he is talking about ethical aspect of Popper epistemology instead of value commitments or value aspect uh, of proper epistemology. And I think that we have to make that distinction. And I think that that could clarify the issue here about proper commitment to values in general or to epistemic or to non-epistemic value or ethical values. What do you think about it? I, I would agree. I gave about Popper and conventionalism because I was there saying that in Popper, he says, in effect, there's a clear cut in more recent terms, you, you want to be a realist and interested in truth or whether your conception of science is one simply for the uh, uh, convenience of predictions or whatever. And um, certainly you can say, well, these are different values. And then depending on which choice you've made about these, then uh, other uh, uh, ways of behaving will then make sense. It's also possible to uh, engage in critical discussion Uh, goes beyond what he was saying in the logic of scientific discovery. But I, I very much agree with you, but I would also say to the people who are pressing the ethical stuff, Popper sometimes himself did make statements about that, but it seems to me that he, he didn't say, make these things very clear, and he certainly didn't make a good case for the ethical element of these things. Have we? Can someone indicate that they want to come back in? Stick your hand up, Margareta. Yes, um, I, I like to follow up on the on the question of epistemology, whether that comes before ethics. I would argue that logic becomes before epistemology, and that is about the distinctions uh, that we make and that, that is precisely what the world, uh, the three world hypothesis is. 
the Zapopper say we need to make a distinction between the world or the real and on the reasonable, that's world too. And on the theories uh, that we write down on paper and, and send in the world with, with the reflection of our thinking. So, so that, and I'm not saying that logic is actually 100% prior though from a developmental viewpoint i think babies are logical without being epistemological because they don't have a sense of whether knowledge is true or false but, but they do make distinctions uh, but then as an adult we we need to use the two together that is we need to see what distinctions are we making and then and then uh, what, what, what knowledge do we have about the resulting distinctions? And so, um, okay, so I'm just curious how you would see, but, to but, but what What I would say is uh, there are different logics and it's a matter of, uh, I mean, we, we need to make use of something uh, in common sense discourse yeah. there is now but there's normally uh, not a particular problem and if problems arise uh popper's view certainly is that one needs only when they arise to stop and deal with them if you're interested in uh logic in a more formal sense there are a range of different alternatives, and between these, effectively, uh, we choose depending on what our aim is. I mean, it's a little bit like a, a choice of different armaments, so that if one wants to knock down a castle wall, one does one thing. If one wants to shoot a sparrow or something, then one, one, one uses something different, and there can be discussion about that. Yes, and, and that is where the Aristotle's uh, last oh, comment... Don't. Why do you bring in Aristotle? I mean, so just on the grounds that he, I mean, he was an important guy in his day. Uh, pretty much everything that he had to say about logic has been long superseded. And I, I am not quite sure why there is such an attachment to him. Well, Jeremy, okay, maybe because I'm moving in circles where, where people happily violate them every day. That's number one. So, so I see where it's totally ignored. And number two, I think there is more to be said about Aristotle, thanks to Popper and, and, and his uh, interest in Tarkis, uh, Tars, Tarkis theory who rehabilitated a little piece of Aristotle that is directly connected with the law of non-contradiction. And now uh, the, the third point I wanted to make, I agree with how you talk about the logic, but there is also the informal logic uh, that, that regulates our conversation. And, and, and it's about that one uh, that I think the popper is talking to us. That he says we, we cannot trivialize that logic and act as if it's all self-evident to everyone because there will be people who confuse the informal logic with all those artificial logics and then they come up with this wild interpretation of time going backward and, and, and in circles and I don't know whatever and they forget that it's all in their heads and, and that it's not the reality. Well, uh, look, there, is, there are... Uh, there are there are, different, yeah. there are different things. First of all, as I suggested before, uh, Popper's uh, view on this, as, like on issues to do with meaning, is essentially that uh, one deals with these things on an ad hoc basis when a problem arises. Second, you've talked about a variety of things some of which are matters of logic, some of which aren't. Third, that if you're going to invoke logic, then I, I just strongly suggest decoupling this from invoking Aristotle. Okay. 
this... interesting things to say, but the kind of uh, syllogistic logic associated with Aristotle is a rather developed more recently. So it's just purely strategically don't bring in uh, Well, um, <laughs> I okay, you broke up a little bit, but I just want to say that, that I honestly think that, that this is the big mistake that, that we, that the logicians have screwed over Aristotle, let's say it in this way, and that he needs to be rehabilitated. But I, I'll, I'll let it go for now. I don't know. I mean, I tend to feel that that is getting you in for, into necrophilia. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? I have Philip. You um, need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I have unmuted. Uh, are, you, are you sure this, oh, sorry, this is on a different point, so, so I don't want yes, to. Yes, no, that, that's fine. We can come okay. back to well, that. Well, I mean, I, that, though I, I uh, would endorse the, the view that, that in, a, in a sense, um, the ethical commitment under underpins um, the the epistemological uh, commitment. So I so I think I, I would agree with uh, Carlos and John on on this particular point. Um, my my, my I'm, I'm going to go off in a slightly different direction, very okay. different direction, in fact, if I may. Um, you you were last week talking about Lakatosh, and we um, noticed the the emergence. Sound has faded. Sorry, do you hear me? I do now. You you were okay. saying you were talking about Lakatosh. Yeah, yeah. Last week we we talked a little of, about Lakatosh and and um, I I suggested that there was some similarity, not not a massive amount of similarity, of course, but but some similarity in, in the starting point, which is uh, of of Lakatosh and Bartley, um, in questioning the demarcation criteria, um, and um, I think that there's also uh, another element of possible overlap here and that is the um that that what what we find so disheartening in in um Lakatosh's strategy may have been his response to the situation he observed where Bartley was uh, ostracized from the popper circle i suggest um that, that uh, uh, Lakatosh had been close by uh, Popper when uh, Bartley had been criticized for his 1965 conference paper, the paper he presented at the very last day of the, uh, the conference uh, in, in July of 1965. Um, uh, it, it had led to apparently to threats to exclude Bartley from publication. Um, and um, I, I wonder whether, <laughs> The rather strange tactics that, that we observed uh, last week regarding Lakatosh, whether that was, if you will, um, an entirely rational uh, response of, of a person who feared his own ostracization, his ost uh, he, that he himself would be excluded, as Bartley had been in the immediate aftermath of the 1965 events. Um, would, you, would you comment on that? I actually yes. did send you an email separately, but you probably haven't received that yet. Yes. Or have Yes, I have. The situation is really this. Um, Popper was, sorry, Lakatosh was the conference organizer and had been expecting Bartley to give a paper on a different historical topic. Bartley then gave the uh, a paper in which effectively he explored Popper. It seems to me that intellectually, there wasn't in fact much to separate them and that Bartley was, I think Popper would in fact However, the difference were very much of Lakatosh's making. He was the person 
who was trying to exclude Bartley's and uh, this nasty dispute as the conference was held under the auspices, I think, of the British Society for the Philosophy of Science. Uh, in the, uh, Bartley complained to them, uh, a committee was set up to investigate the issues. And I, I mean, it was just a, a, a terrible mess. Um, this, I think, I don't think it was an, an element of insecurity on Lakatoshi's part, so much as a, a, a combination of his intellectually not liking Bartley's piece, together with a kind of political power play on his part. And it seems to have caused uh, enormous bad feeling altogether, and particularly to have had a, a pretty dire psychological effect on Bartley himself. Um, so I, 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 I mean, there were features of Lakatosh's position that were precarious, but I, my own reading of the situation here is that this was all very much. The papers and correspondence about this uh, are in the Lakatosh archive. You have to look around for them. And there may also be stuff in the Watkins archive at the LSE as well. Thank you. I, I, I missed uh, quite a large chunk of what, what you were saying. You kept fading in and out. And maybe that's I, just my connection. But, no, no, uh, no. Yeah, I mean, you did disappear for a while. Basically, just very briefly, what I was saying was that the, ex the attempted ex exclusion was by Lakatosh. Right. Rather than uh, Bartley. OK. Thank, thank you. I, I, we'll, we'll, I'll uh, email you and, yes. and try to, to learn a little more about this because I, I, I uh, was rather confused about that. Thank you so much for answering that. Thank okay. you. John, you want to come back? Uh, yes, I was wondering if, um, please don't take this personally, but uh, it's only because of the internet. <laughs> if, if Philip might, might just say briefly what, what was so uh, controversial about Bartley's paper in 1965. Um, yeah, well, I, I can, though I'm, I think uh, Jeremy has indicated a, a far deeper knowledge of the entire background than I would have. I have mm, read... During the, the Lakatos uh, presentation. Yeah, so... So, ah, so, okay. so, 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 no, 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 I mean, um, sorry, I didn't mean to refer back to that. I mean, but this, there was, I mean, I mentioned this last week and, and uh, Jeremy and I discussed a little bit of that, but he has clarified some of this just now. Um, uh, that I, that I had misunderstood uh, apparently, but but um, what 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 uh, I had picked up on. Sorry, yes. Sorry, Jeremy. Do you just you just said my name? So I'm, I'm wondering if did I, you, did I your miss, your yes. sound disappeared. Okay. Can I, can other people hear me? His 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 sound didn't disappear from for me. Yeah, I think it, okay. it might be your internet going the other direction. Uh, I, I think I think Jeremy, that it, it's your your connection because. Uh, right. But I am. Uh, um, uh, so so uh, someone else has also mentioned. So so uh, Bartley had presented a paper on the last day of the conference in 1965, July 16th, 1965, um, which uh, was critical of of uh, Popper and in particular suggested that the demarcation criterion. Oh yeah, was... I know the paper. I know the paper. Okay, so so, yeah. so that mm -hmm. so there was that uh, that that was the the initial pursuit. So um, I, sorry, I thought that was what you were asking about. But... Yeah, no, it, because you said that. Uh... The demarcation should just be between good and bad, or something like that. It was a very kind of a well, vague right. presentation of, of the demarcation. Yeah, he, well, was, uh, reject, he was rejecting Popper's uh, demarcation criteria. Well, I remember. So, 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 so the significance between the of the divide between metaphysics and, and science, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, to some extent, um, Lakatosh also revisits exactly that point, uh, both in his 1970 paper and, and in his contribution to the. Um, the, uh, the Schiff volume, uh, Schiff volume um, uh, in, in 1974, the, um, I think. The, 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 um, but anyway, that, that, that was the connection I was looking at. Okay. I, in, in Popper's letter to uh, Bartley that was written a couple of days after, he refers to having consulted uh, Imre, who I assume is Imre Lakatosh, and, and um, had sought to um, 
ward off or to mitigate any of the um, exclusion of Bartley from various publications that, that would come out of the conference mm -hmm. and might come out of other. So, so I, it was in terms of, um, I, I had thought it was Imre who had interceded on behalf of Bartley to, to soften the blow, uh, soften the exclusion, but it, according to, to Jeremy, it's exactly the other way around, and I have misunderstood that. Power play on, on, on the part of Lacazette. Yes, um, I mean, he was the editor of the mm -hmm. volume, and it was he who was saying that Bartley's piece shouldn't be published. Uh, Popper had um, indeed been upset by it, but I think that the, the reason was that Bartley was essentially raising points that it's not clear that Popper himself actually disagreed with. And I think that uh, what you you couldn't hear me, Philip. No, no, I can hear you, but I, I, I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm, I'm probably gesticulating because I disagree uh, okay. with that interpretation. Um, but well, <laughs> and just um, in the sense that once one had got um, Popper's uh, paper published about the criticizability of meta. metaphysical research programs, then um, substantively, it's not that clear uh, what uh, real disagreement there actually was. And I, I took it myself that Popper's, I mean, a, a strong concern about Popper was But it seemed to him that there wasn't a lot separating him from what Bartley was saying, but Bartley seemed to be making an enormous fuss about it. And one could say in a similar way with regard to Lakatosh, but while, as I've explained, there are differences between their views, the over and repackaging Popperian themes, again, made it a little difficult, I think, for Popper to know quite how to handle it. Yeah, I, I, so, um, okay, f first of all, Popper seems much more unhappy with Bartley's paper than you seem to suggest. I mean, the, the, the letter that Popper wrote on, it's dated the 20th of July. I don't know if it, if it actually started on the 20th of July and then finished it a week or two later. It seems to have been something that he stewed over for a while. Uh, he, he, he was furious of what he saw as a misrepresentation and a, a distortion of his view uh, by Bartley. Uh, that comes out and he basically uh, urges Bartley to come and, and sit with him and explain to him how Bartley could have misunderstood um, Popper's views when Popper had explained them so clearly on so many occasions and you know but basically um, all, all can be well if you come and reconcile with me it seems that that's how I read uh, that long you know what is it six page letter uh, very, very very closely written uh, Popper was furious about Bartley and so it's not just what Lakatosh was doing it seems to me uh, but also that Popper himself was was uh, distanced from Bartley and was quite prepared to break all contact with him if that was really uh, what, what Bartley would prefer. If Bartley wants to walk away, then fair enough, let him walk away. That seems to be the bottom line. Again, there is a fury directed at Lakatosh um, after the, uh, the, the, the emergence of, of Lakatosh's paper and uh, the various addenda to that. It seems um, that, that, that Lakatosh has distorted that now Lakatosh, I think, shifts his position, keeps shifting his position. He does so strategically, I think, because I thought because uh, he felt himself particularly vulnerable and isolated. He was a, a refugee without who was dependent on employment connected to um, pe people connected with Popper, it seemed initially, whereas Barclay had, had other options. Um, and and <laughs> so, 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 so some of the strategy that, that, that um, Lakatosh adopted, which is not admirable, but nonetheless is understandable in the circumstances, may have resulted from his sense that if he um, was 
he was too rapid in his criticism, he would suffer the same fate, he believed, yeah. Bartley has made. So that, that's my, I, I probably have misunderstood quite a bit of, of the, the material. I, I, certainly he had, uh, th there was a problem about his status in Britain. Mm -hmm. Exactly what lay behind that isn't altogether clear, but one element of it could have been that he had, uh, after his imprisonment in Hungary, worked as an informer for the Hungarian Secret Service. And one simply doesn't know Secret Services knew about him. I knew Lakatos personally, and mm -hmm. you, you, I mean, you can't imagine anyone who was in some respect more cocksure of himself than mm. was Lakatosh. Uh, okay. And uh, it was Bartley who was um, certainly someone who was vulnerable. I don't know in that setting mm. whether the fact that he was gay had presented a problem in the background. I mean, I'd, I'd have to look at the dates for legalization of homosexuality and so on. But the, 1965, well, yeah. yeah 69, but, I think, yeah, is the decriminalization in Britain we're talking about. Really the case that Bill mm. was, uh, I mean, he was a, uh, he was a, a charming and self-confident figure also, mm. his ability to kind of uh, get at people and so on. But he seems just personally to have been shattered by espe especially the encounter with Lakatosh. So I, I, I mean, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I knew both of them. Uh, Bill was still in, he knew him in the San Francisco area um uh, a, a bit uh, some while later and he was if anything somewhat paranoid and uh, my reading of it was that the it, it had been this uh, uh controversy which Lakatosh was stirring which had led to the problem but at any rate the place to look on this is the uh relevant archives um with material in both the Lakatosh and possibly the Watkins, but I'll, I'll send you an email about that. If, if you would, one, one last thing, if I may ask, and maybe this is someone else on the group knows this, um, we have the Stasi archives, uh, I, and I know that some of the- Sorry, uh, we have the what archives? Stasi archives from East Germany. I'm wondering whether, uh, the, I mean, the allegation against, um, against Lakatosh that he was a Hungarian communist agent uh, surely would have been investigated because once uh, post-1989, we would have had some access, or some would have had some access, I think, to those archives in Budapest. Um, has anything come out since um, since those archives, I, I believe, were, were, were available? I mean, if, if, we are saying, if, if their claim is that uh, part of Lakatosh's background and part of the distrust of Lakatosh was that he was possibly a Hungarian communist agent, is there any evidence of that that's come out from the, from post-1989 availability of archives? So at that point, I'll take myself off the... Yeah. I, I don't know, but what I would say is that this business of his having acted as an informant is fairly clear-cut. And um, it's also the case that one of the books about him does recount... Uh, some information about his interviews with the uh, with British Secret Service people. Um, I haven't looked in in regard to particularly that, but I'll see if I can find some references. Okay, I've got now uh, Luke, and then John. Luke. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if this uh, the archives from uh, Hungary are open. From the Eastern Germany, they were open, and you could go and uh, see them. I'm not so sure about Hungary that anybody just can go and see these, got these archives. I'm not sure. I don't know, but uh, I doubt it. That's all I have. 
Okay, John. Yes, back back to to Lakatos, uh, because um, um, you you were talking uh, last time about um, his uh, a position being similar to that of Popper in in Chapter Ten of the Congestions and Limitations lately, yeah. Um, but um, it seems to me uh, Lakatos was, was a, a a Marxist himself, right? And, and does he he seems to have been quite influenced by by Hegel, as you said, no? Um, wouldn't this not make him, I mean, first of all, uh, if he's following Hegelian di dialectic logic, that's very, very different than Popper. He condemned that very much. And if he is uh, giving up on, you know, formally giving up on realism, it would seem to me he doesn't really have very much at all to do with critical rationalism from that point on. Well, let me go back to this briefly. There is a sense in which uh, Lakatos, when he does the three divisions of Popper, kind of plays off um, ideas that one gets in uh, the conjectures and refutations discussion against other statements either by or by people who have been influenced by Popper. The Hegelian material is really, um, it relates to the sense in which in Hegel, you get the idea of a um, rational disclosure of the truth through history, mm -hmm through the instrumentality of people's actions, but not necessarily as fitting their particular intentions or ideas about what they're doing. And- uh, the, world spirit, the world spirit is working through them. The yes, world. yes. But there is this, but what, what you have to do though is to put the, I mean, the, the question of how it, how this stuff is to be understood metaphysically, there was ongoing dispute about uh, amongst the followers of Hegel. And then uh, Lakatos obviously comes uh, late on the scene where this is seen in kind of more materialist rather than uh, religious terms. But mm -hmm. the key th thing is this, ideas. One of them is the idea that uh, there is continuing uh, development in uh, ideas about what makes science acceptable and that these change through time and change over history. Mm -hmm. himself And that one can actually see on the part of leading scientists, people actually behaving in accordance with this in uh, e even though their official views about what one should be doing may be different from. Mm -hmm. Lakatosh's work. But there is certainly a, 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 a Hegelian brand to this material. And in his uh, Cambridge dissertation, he does uh, refer explicitly to Hegel's logic. But contradiction in Hegel is more a matter of uh, tension between different perspectives and then uh, they're being superseded by something else r rather than something that's just chaotic. Uh, there, there's a, a bit of uh, material about this. If you, you send, again, send me an email specifically mm -hmm. on this and but, I can write back about it. But just very quick question. But what would you say about uh, Popper's uh, uh, paper, What is Dialectic? It seems to be a, a quite an open attack on, on Hegelian logic, no? Yes, but we're not talking, I mean, we're, that, that's perfectly true. But what I'm talking about is something rather different. Uh-huh, okay. Thank you. Okay, 
but so what I'm saying is I, I will I will write with references to you about this if you send me an email about specifically about this. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Huh? Margareta. Uh, you need to unmute. Unmute. You're still muted. <laughs> now, I hope I'm unmuted. First, a quick comment to uh, John uh, uh, in regard to some things that John said and then a question for you, Jeremy. So when I was talking about people deliberately changing the meaning of a word, I wasn't talking about Hegel. I, I think that Hegel, that, that Popper uh, used Hegel as a whipping boy for, for all sorts of other problems in society. Um, and and uh, if the, 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 the use, the changing of the meaning of a word that, that can be part of a disinformation strategy, but that's completely different from Hegel. Now, to get back to Hegel, I think what has not been appreciated enough that he's really trying to understand the process of change and, and that process is still poorly understood or people are still debating what does change mean and can we go backward in time, for example. Uh, now, Jeremy, the question for you, I, I'm curious what Popper would say about the concept of circular causality. And specifically, that is in reference to the work of the sociologist Luhmann and George Spencer Brown. And now those are cyberneticians. And, and I don't, um, I, I want to be agnostic about whether you, whether they're doing something good or something bad or, or, or what cybernetics is all about. But I'm particularly curious to know whether Popper ever would go along with saying, Yes, uh, causality is circular under certain circumstances. What are your viewpoints on that? He wrote uh, quite a bit of stuff on the objectivity of the arrow of time and on the uh, sort of uh, linearity of time. But he was discussing this in the context of physical science. And so I don't think that he was addressing the specific issues that you're talking about. So you, okay, so what, what I hear you say, there are like different situations in which people bring up the argument of circular causality and uh, Popper never wrote the paper kind of addressing well, all the different ways. That, no. that is an unexplored area in Popper. So to say, yes. I mean, he I, well, he he wrote uh, on. I mean, the relatively technical subject of the arrow of time. Okay. Yeah. I, um, but I I do not know enough about the views that you are referring to to be able to say whether or not there is anything in his work that pertains to them. If you can send me a reference to something on the basis of that, I might be able to respond. Thank you. Anyone further? John, is this an old hand or a new one? It's an old, it's an old hand. <laughs> okay. Is there anyone else who wants to come in now? Okay. Well, look, let me leave this. Uh, thank you all very much. And I will, get on, I will get on to my ISP people and to see if they can throw any light on uh, why this problem has developed this week. Thank you all very okay, much. Sure. And I'll send the notes out uh, uh, early next week. Thanks hopefully, very much. Uh, hopefully your, your recording will be uh, uh, a little bit better. Huh? Mm -hmm. We can hope. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.